thanks for coming. Um, this is the race to the bottom, low latency in the age of the transformer. Uh, thanks to everybody at uh, Berlin Buzzwords who invited me to give this talk today. It's a short talk, it's 20 minutes. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot to cover. Uh, it's impossible to cover everything in the 20 minute time span. I'll do my best. Um, if you have any questions, please get in touch with me afterwards. So I'm Max Irwin. I'm the founder and chief everything officer at max.io, uh, where I make Mighty Inference Server, which is uh, a scalable inference engine based on Rust and Onyx and Onyx runtime. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all these bullet points. Just importantly, I've been coding for a long time. I've been doing search for a while, starting in around 2010, 2011. Uh, with keyword search and then semantic search in 2015, semantic. Then I started getting into the vector search stuff uh, right around 2018, 2019, um, when I was uh, working with open source connections. Uh, I participated in last year's big ANN vector competition uh, with Dima Khan and some other folks where I made Buddy PQ. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm also uh, contributing to a book called AI Powered Search with Trey Granger and Doug Turnbull, um, where I write about semantic search and question answering uh, with some of the techniques I'll show today. And sometime it'll be printed. It's, a, it's on Meep right now if you want to check it out. So uh, what are we talking about when we talk about inference and low latency and all these, all these fancy words? So... The solution context I'm going to talk about today is primarily around getting embeddings or vectors from, uh, from a model and then using those vectors to index them in an approximate nearest neighbor search index. And then, uh, so that's, you know, at index time and then at query time, you need vectors when somebody types in a text query, for example. You inference the vectors from the text query or the embeddings and then you run uh, a similarity search uh, with the approximate nearest neighbor vector search engine. Um, so there are a couple of examples. Uh, uh, Alessandro Benediti, who uh, just gave uh, a talk about vector search in, in solar. Um, there's a, a starter kit, if you want to start playing around with that, that uses uh, some of the tools I'm going to show today um, in this neural solar. And then there's a, <clears throat> there's a vector search engine called Quadrant, which is open source and written in Rust. And there's another starter kit um, that, again, uses Mighty and uh, will let you use Mighty in, in coordination with, uh, with Quadrant. There's also some other things you can do. There's extractive question answering, which is what I like to call really fancy highlighting, uh, the text classification, token classification. And there's a whole bunch of other use cases uh, when you talk about inference and latency of inference. And these things tend to be quite slow and bulky. So that's why I'm here today. So, <clears throat> again, what is inference? So we take some text, in this case, hello, Berlin buzzwords, and we uh, pass the text into a model, and we do inference against the model. So we have to tokenize and then take the tokenized IDs, um, provide those as inputs, and then the inputs to the model will produce a result. And the result looks like this. So it's basically a bunch of numbers. So in this case, we have uh, a, basically an array of floating point, floating point numbers, which is just a big vector. Um, <clears throat> and that's basically what we're talking about. How do you, how do you go from the text to getting, uh, getting these vectors? So I'm going to show a demo. And then I'm going to talk about, it's a little bit flipped on its head. I'm going to talk about. Uh, what cost and hosting analysis looks like for something like this. Because when teams come in and they want to get started with approximate nearest neighbor search or uh, model inference using a transformer, it's, it's a cost that they're not used to. And it's typically quite large. Um, and it can be a little bit jarring. And we'll talk about then how overhead occurs and how we reduce the overhead for inference and how to make things faster and lighter and more efficient. And then the areas of optimization specifically around different things like models, software, hardware, stuff like that. And then uh, hopefully time for one or two questions at the end. 
So now I'm going to give a demo and I always offer this uh, USB converter to the demo gods as an offering. Please let my demo go well. Thank you, you uh, thank you, uh, demo gods. All right, again, on the left we have a client and on the right we have a server. So I'm going to start a cluster. Oops. And it may take a moment for this to update, but you'll see a whole bunch of stuff flashing on the on the right terminal. Um, <clears throat> basically, I've started uh, on a 128 core machine, 128 independent inference cores. So we can look and we see a whole bunch of cores that are now running as processes. And I can just do a quick count. And I can see that we have 128 uh, cores. So now I'm going to show the top command quickly. And I'm just going to run a performance. <clears throat> I'm just going to run a performance command from the client. And now you can see the CPU is starting to spike. It doesn't show all of the, uh, it doesn't show all of the, uh, the, the cores. It doesn't fit on the screen. But you can see that various different performance metrics will use uh, different uh, amounts of the CPU. So we're going to max out. Um, and there's a, there's a load balancer that takes care of some of this. We're going to max out at about 38, uh, 3,300 requests or 3,400 requests. And what I'm showing here is we have the requests per second are showing. And then we have uh, the latency histogram. So that's pretty much it. That's the end of the demo. But what you were seeing was I was just sending uh, thousands of requests to the, the inference cores and getting back responses. OK, so now I'm done with the demo. And I'm going to go back to the slides. I'll give that a moment to catch up. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for the presentation to be shared again. Sorry for the delay. And thank you all for coming uh, for, to the remote session. I'm sorry I'm not there in Berlin. I really wish I was there. Uh, I'm at home in the United States. And I'm still not, okay, and we're back to the slides. Thank you so much. So, uh, what we saw was various uh, various throughputs and latency. So this talk is about latency, but latency and throughput are very closely connected, uh, depending on how you organize the resources on a machine. So you can see the throughput in uh, some situations can be, you know, 880 requests per second or queries per second on a 32 vCPU machine, um, and you can see on a 128 VCU mach uh, vCPU machine. You can scale that linearly um, if you do things right, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, the latency is about you know between twenty and sixty milliseconds, um, you know, and there's some outliers depending on what's happening. But for the most part, you take a look at um, you know the histogram of, of latency. You don't just go on one number. So the cost for this thing is uh, it can be quite expensive. So what I was just showing you on Amazon um, is, is a lot, right? So you can spend a lot of money on Amazon if you want to. A, a one year reserved instance price is about 360 an hour and that's in dollars. Um, or on uh, a 32 thread machine and these are compute optimized, it's about 80, 88 cents or 90 cents. Uh, you can get things a lot cheaper. So if you use something, for example, like Hetzner Cloud, uh, there's no affiliation. I'm just showing examples. Um, you can take the cost of, you know, how many CPUs you need, um, how many uh, per, how many queries per second you need, and then you can do a cost analysis to understand what it's going to cost you to host an inference server uh, to meet your customer requirements. 
So this calculation is quite easy if you have a solution that can scale linearly like I just showed. Um, some solutions do not scale linearly. Sometimes it's just basically you're, you're stuck with what you get. And then I've seen like quadratic uh, extrapolation and things like that if you're, if you're overloading and, and trying to do things that you shouldn't. Um, but for the most part, you can spend you know, 40 euros a month and get about 100, quer 100 queries per second, which is more than most teams need. So that's about a million, uh, the 3 million queries per day. Uh, per peak time in an eight hour period. Uh, just for fun, I went all the way to the bottom where we have like, you know, close to a billion requests in 24 hours. And that's like 5,000 uh, euro per month. Um, you know, if you, if you need a billion requests in 24 hours, most people do not. So how do you get there? So how do you get to this uh, thing that I showed where you can do a linear scale uh, using using a CPU without without a GPU, or using more exotic hardware, using something that's um, more specific and fit to your needs. So first, we have to look at what an inference request actually looks like, and you take content and you pass it in to an inference server. The, re the inference server is responsible for handling the request. So that could be an HTTP request or a gRPC request or something else. Um, then you have to do pre-processing because you're passing in text and you have to prepare the text to pass into the model. Then the model is hosted typically in a runtime, like, uh, you know, in this case, uh, I was showing Onyx runtime, which is wrapped in the application, but you can do like libpytorch or, you know, TensorRT, uh, some other uh, runtimes will wrap the model. And then that's just the inference part, but you do have the preparation that's required. And then afterwards, you have to post-process. So especially if you're, you know, if you're taking just vectors um, and sending them out, then you can just send the vectors out. But if you're doing something like sentence transformers, you have to do like mean pooling, um, and you, you know, extractive question answering. You have to, you know, align the uh, probabilities with the with the tokens and the context, things like that. And then at the end, you get the outputs, and then you use the outputs uh, further on in your solution. So the three things that people focus on when they try to make things scalable, uh, faster, um, with higher throughput, uh, smaller models, better hardware, and software efficiency. And those are the three things, uh, three areas that, that people look at. And there's a lot of uh, effort that goes in, into these things. I don't have enough time to dig into uh, all of the details here. Uh, and there's a whole field in this area. But I'll, I'll give a, an overview, so if things sound interesting, you can take a look and dive deeper. So when we talk about models, um, the model overhead is the, is the thing that you typically want to uh, reduce. Uh, an, a model tends to be like, you know, between 400 megabytes and, a, you know, a, giga, a gigabyte and a half for, te for text uh, by encoder models is typically what I'm talking about, um, or question answering models, things like that. So how do you make those smaller? Um, and when we talk about uh, smaller, uh, those are typically in the realm of parameters. So every calculation that has to be done um, when you're passing uh, inputs through all the layers in the deep neural network. And then this is pretty slow, right? So you have billions of parameters, and every time you pass in a set of inputs, it takes a while to get to the other side. You know, hardware is really fast these days, uh, but still, uh, it, it, it's relatively slow. We're talking, you know, 25 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds on CPU, um, <clears throat> just for one query. So the techniques to make the models faster uh, there are there are many, but the four that I'll just quickly overview. So there's there's distillation. So distillation is taking a large model, and then you take a, what what we call the teacher student. Um, so the large model is the teacher, and then you train a student model which is smaller, uh, based on uh, what the teacher model knows, right? And so you can train a smaller model, and the technique is known as distillation. Then you can uh, that's uh, typically just to reduce uh, the layers and size of the model. 
Um, then you have something called quantization. So quantization is just reducing uh, the uh, possibilities of the values inside of each parameter. So in this case, I'm showing you know floating point 32 bit. Uh, instead of using floating points, you use uh, int dates. So you you basically get a fourth the size um, because a byte is you know an eight bit byte uh, compared to a 32 bit floating point is pretty small. Pruning and sparse uh, is just removing uh, areas of the network, connections and uh, weights and parameters that aren't used. Um, and you can train something like that. Mixed precision is when you just mix uh, you know, floating points with FP16s, FP30, uh, FP32s, and dates, depending on what the model needs. Better hardware is, well, you have to you know, spend time on uh, understanding how you optimize a CPU, for example, you can spend money on GPUs. Um, so you can use like V100s, and these are tensor cores that NVIDIA produces. Some of them are very expensive. Uh, you can use cloud vertical specific hardware, so TPUs in Google Cloud, Amazon Inferentia. Uh, and you can do exotic stuff. You can map an FPGA to a deep learning, uh, a deep neural network. You can use something like GraphCore, which is a, a, special, a special processor that they have their own cloud, things like that. And then with software efficiency, software efficiency so you can take uh, hardware and understand what your target is and then optimize your software around how you want to target uh, the hardware that you know you're going to be using. So this is uh, Onyx Runtime. You can go to onyxruntime.ai and you can play around with clicking the little boxes here and um, see the solution that comes out. Then with software efficiency, uh, people tend to focus on language performance. So it's really tiny on the screen, but the, the red boxes in the bottom are Python. And then in the middle, you have Go. And in the bottom, you have Rust. So just switching from Python to a faster, more efficient language typically buys you a lot in the pre-processing and post-processing. Then you focus on algorithms. So the again, pre and post-processing. Um, and then hardware synergy. So optimized runtimes, uh, SIMD, vectorization. And uh, just making sure that you're getting everything out of the hardware as possible using the software tools at your disposal. So cost and trade-offs, you can try to target CPU uh, like I showed today. Um, you have to spend a bunch of time to do that. You can use GPU instances, so you don't have to spend as much time, but it costs a lot more money to host. And you can just say, I don't want to deal with it. And you know, if you have money to burn, you can just use a third-party API uh, and, and they'll handle it for you, but you're going to end up paying a lot more money than you'd like to. And that is all. I clicked the thing, but we're not at the next slide yet. But um, uh, that's, that's the presentation. It was really short. Um, we got a little tripped up in the demo, so I ran out of time. But if you have... Uh, if you have questions, um, if we have time for questions, I'm not sure, but please let me know. Otherwise, get in touch. Uh, my contact information is in the slides. Yeah, maybe we have one or two questions. Quick. Yeah. Your second then. Thank you very much. It was uh, really interesting. I was wondering if you have anything to say about um, sentence transformers on GPUs. What I usually see is that uh, you get very low utilization of the GPU. Um, yeah, if you have anything to say about that. Yeah, it depends on how you are loading the model and what you're doing. With it. When you say GPU, it's hard to say because, again, there's a very close relationship between the software and the hardware. So you may be seeing low optimization if you're just trying to run something in Python using PyTorch and then loading uh, the model up into the device using PyTorch. You probably have better performance if you're using something like TensorRT, uh, if you're using a GPU that has tensor cores. Um, so you may see something there. Also, uh, remember what I said about the pre and, pre and post processing. So you may see something slow if you are doing mean pooling um, or if you have a lot of inputs and you're trying to vec if you're trying to get embeddings for uh, like a whole paragraph versus a query that can impact things as well. Um, the relationship of how you are running threads, passing uh, passing uh, the model from a CPU to the GPU, 
that doesn't have uh, affinity um, because like the, the RAM connectivity and requirements there. Uh, sometimes you can, you end up doing more hops than you should, and that can slow things down. Uh, there's some interesting blog posts about that, which I'll uh, try to dig up and post in the chat after the talk. Okay, quick last question. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so my question is uh, maybe simple, uh, but then sort of complicated. Let's say you have some POC with some transformer-based models that work pretty well in terms of performance, in terms of quality, but it's too slow. Like, is there like a general framework you can use to figure out where you should start? You mentioned distillation, you mentioned you know using different hardware, etc. but there's a lot of different solutions to look at, right? And mm -hmm. is, is there like a general like first step to look into or is it really problem dependent? Like, do you have something to say about that? I would start with distillation and pure, if you're using models like sentence transformers, um, there are distilled models that are used as the base models for the, the state of the art sentence transformer models that are out there these days. If you're using something else, um, I definitely recommend starting with distillation because that's uh, typically the, the best thing that you can do. You can train a smaller model and the model, uh, the number of parameters in the model will shrink. And that's the bulk of the overhead, I, I should say. Um, in terms of accuracy, there will be some accuracy loss. So that's another challenge. Uh, if you're looking into something like quantization, there are different types of quantization where uh, the accuracy just is terrible uh, after you uh, quantize the model. Um, but uh, if you do like uh, training aware quantization, um, or even automatic mixed precision, that can uh, get you a lot of the way there as well. Also, interestingly, if you're, if you're doing something like quantization, um, sometimes it ends up being slower because of the way that, again, the way the software is interacting with the hardware can be quite tricky. So you have to make sure that the hardware you're using will vectorize appropriately and use the quantization to, uh, to its fullest. Hey, thank you very much, Max Irvin. Uh, give a warm applause for Max.